Constantine, welcome back. Thanks for having me. So the reason we're talking now is because of Russia, Ukraine. You've obviously got family connections to both, and I've seen you go through this really, what looks like a really emotional, very personal process over the last few weeks, given what's happening. Firstly, how, how has that been? Yeah, well, I went through, you know, all the stages of grief in kind of in about a week um, from I think a lot of people were initially in denial about what's happened, even though I really wasn't. I was saying the invasion is going to happen before it happened and all of that. But even though I was saying it logically, knowing that it was about to happen, there was a part of me that still didn't believe that, you know, the places I'd grown up as a kid or where I met my wife or where I go several times every year to see family would be, you know, in a war zone and being bombarded. So denial, then I was very angry about it. Uh, and you go through all the stages before finally, I think, you know, you get to a point where you accept what's going on. Uh, and you, you, you do what you can about it. We raised over 55,000 pounds for humanitarian charities and like an hour and a half on trigonometry. So a lot of our audience felt very strongly about it as well. Um, you do what you can. I, I spent, you know, because of a few people I know and a few connections that I've made over the last few years, I kind of had a bit of an inside track on what was probably going to happen. So I warned a lot, everyone that I could in Ukraine to get out of the cities and to get west, not necessarily into Western Europe, but just into Western Ukraine to start with or into the villages or whatever, because it was good. even at the very beginning, it was very clear what Russia's tactics were going to be, how they were going to use, uh, how they were going to deal with cities. They were going to bombard the shit out of them, basically. Um, so I, I've been able to kind of focus my energies on the, the most constructive thing I can do. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, obviously when you, you know, when I think about my grandmother, who's 96 and in Dnipro in Ukraine, who lived through the Nazi occupation and right at the end of her life to see this thing that was the worst horror that she could possibly have imagined repeating itself. You know, it's painful. It's painful for people in Ukraine. It's painful for me to think about her. And, and that's what I really struggle with is, you know, the Russian narrative is, well, we're, we're protecting Russians and we're rebuilding the Ruski Mir, the Russian world. And these are the people who are bombing Russian cities. They're destroying the ancient city of Chernigov in the north, for example. Russian churches that were built during, yes, they were in the Russian Empire, right? But they are the ones that are destroying them. And it hurts to see that. Uh, and this false narrative about it really, really, it, it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. And I think it's, um, you know, it, it's so fundamentally dishonest and I really uh, I took that part of it to heart in addition to all the human suffering as well like this false narrative about how they're fighting Nazis when actually they are acting exactly like Hitler invading Ukraine and destroying it yeah and I really want to talk about kind of the information side of mm. things as well because um, we both run YouTube channels that are sort of in the contrarian heterodox space and there's a lot of narrative warfare going on mm. in there and I think we both like my background is I've made a couple of documentaries in Russia. I've been a foreign producer for, for quite a long time and dealt with sort of seen conflicts up close and then seen how they're portrayed in the West and how the narrative warfare goes around it. And I'd love to dig in a bit more. Um, and the, the, the one thing that I find really interesting as well is we talk a bit about sort of collapsing your sense making. The idea that people just want a binary narrative. Whereas actually, and I've seen you do this really well in your um, conversations, particularly with Francis on trigonometry, where you will look at both sides and you'll weigh up different things. I mean, you, you've got on one side, like, say, the John Mearsheimer perspective of NATO has been provoking um, or promising Ukraine things that it can't deliver. It's been leading down the primrose path. And there's clearly some truth in that. <laughs> there's obviously a lot of truth in Vladimir Putin believes Ukraine has no right to exist, believes in a greater Russia. And what I find is that people want to collapse around one of those binaries and they go to war for one of those binaries, whereas actually in something this complex and this historical, you've got to be able to weigh all of these different things at the same time. Mm. And I've seen you do that really well. How would you sort of summarize that where you've ended up with the kind of narratives around it? Well, uh, yeah, you're right. I think there was a, a false dichotomy that a lot of people bought into, including myself at the very beginning, because I was like, well, Vladimir Putin is an expansionist authoritarian. 
and he is. Uh, now, was he that same thing 20 years ago? Mm, I don't know, but he is now, right? Um, and at the same time, that doesn't mean that NATO behavior hasn't made him feel threatened, hasn't encouraged him, perhaps hasn't made him feel like well, he's got to act uh, now as well. So where I am on it now is, yes, NATO expansion may have, uh, may not may, NATO expansion causes some people in Russia a lot of unease and concern. Um, and to some extent, when you look at it at a sort of abstract, almost civilization level, as we talked about in one of our videos, it makes sense because the that, the Eastern Christian civilization that Russia is kind of the head of has been invaded by the West. Now, not the West as we would conceive of it by Napoleon and by Hitler, but it basically gets invaded every century. So to think that it wouldn't happen again would be a strategic mistake on Russia's part, on the one hand. On the other hand, personalities do matter in these historical events. And Vladimir Putin uh, is not the worst leader that Russia could have had, not the most authoritarian, not the most brutal, but there would have been others who could have resolved this issue differently. Likewise, in America, perhaps we'll talk about that too. You know, who are the people in charge of these civilizational negotiations also matters. Uh, and I think it's been, there's been irritation from the West but there's also been failures on both sides and the people in charge matter. And I think that's partly where this is coming from as well. It didn't have to be a war. What do you think people on both sides of that argument are getting wrong? There are people like uh, Vladimir Pozner, who, who there's this great talk. He talks about how the West created Vladimir Putin and John Mearsheim, as you point out as well. Uh, and I think what they underestimate is the personality dimension of this. Um, you know, I, I made the point in one of our discussions with me and Francis on trigonometry when he asked me about who is Vladimir Putin, that this is a guy who's from the KGB. He said when he was made prime minister by Boris Yeltsin, he once in the KGB, always in the KGB. And what is the KGB? Well, the KGB is the ideological successor to essentially the Soviet Gestapo. And so what you have is a person of that mentality in charge of a country with 10,000 nuclear weapons. Well, I think that's a factor. And I think to underestimate that, I think is wrong, particularly when he said the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geostrategic catastrophe of the 20th century. And that includes presumably World War II, in which over 20,000 Soviet people died, or Stalin's leadership, in which more than that died, right? So I think they are ignoring the personal dimension of this and who this person is on the one hand. On the other hand, I think... Uh, to say that this is mad Vlad is also, to me at this point, unproven. Now, he, you know, what his mental state is right now, I don't know. I haven't seen anything from him that is out of character or that I would consider irrational at this point. Uh, having said that, he's obviously made a big mistake. I think he massively underestimated the strength of the Western reaction, as I did. You know, my view was, frankly, the West's sort of, this is the final nail in the coffin of the West that we've built for ourselves with our distraction and stupidity and ignorance. Um, and I'm very happy to say that I wasn't quite as wrong as I, you know, as I, I wasn't quite as right as I thought I was, or I'm a lot more wrong than I thought I was about that. I think um, he's been surprised and he's made a mistake. Yeah, I was thinking the other day about this narrative that you hear in, in any any time you talk about any kind of foreign affairs there is a school of thought, usually on the left, which sees the West as being always and always totally responsible for whatever happens. And I was thinking about it and I was like, actually, that that is a comforting feeling because it avoids dealing with the fact that there are external actors with um, who want to do you harm and there's nothing you can do about it. Actually, what it does is it makes you think, well, if only we stopped doing this or we stopped doing this, the world would be a safe place. And and it kind of made more sense from that perspective of like, it, it makes the world feel more controllable. It makes it feel like, well, if only we stopped provoking someone like Vladimir Putin, everything would be OK, rather than Putin's got his own agenda, Putin's got his own motivations. Yeah, and I think the, the biggest flaw in... <clears throat> Broadly speaking, like people think I'm sort of right leaning or whatever. And I'm <clears throat> on some issues I am, on some issues I'm left leaning. But the reason I bring this up is I'm about to make a broad generalization about the left. 
And there's broad generalizations we can make about the right too that are not flattering. But about the left, I would say the biggest flaw of the left is an unwillingness to um, recognize reality and a preference for your own ideological view. And on the right, there's the reverse, which is an over preference for reality, which is often which is often not reality, but the kind of status quo and an unwillingness to recognize that actually reality isn't quite as rigid. And yes, with a bit of effort and social effort, you can change things. But the biggest problem on the left is an, an unwillingness to accept in this particular type of conversation that there is always going to be a civilizational struggle between East and West, North and South and whatever. Um, and that not everything is a product of our, our behavior. Uh, and some conflict between civilizations is inevitable, and maybe we should win that conflict, because if we don't, well, all the things you care about, like equality and diversity and anti-racism, might be in question if Russia or China are in charge of our society. So that, to me, is, I think, where the sort of anti-war left has an issue. And obviously, I'm sure we'll talk about what's happening on the right as well. Yeah, and I feel like you've if, if you haven't sort of gone on a journey, you've at least become more vocal about some of the mm. things that you're seeing in the kind of more contrarian space around this. Because mm. um, in a way, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the arguments that are coming from the left and the arguments that are coming from the right. And you've, you've said this on trigonometry, and we've hosted a lot of people in Rebel Wisdom and making the same point about certain trends of thought on the left mm. are undermining Western mm. values. Mm. They're, they're a fundamental challenge to Western values. Um, but then on the right, you've got this kind of argument that mimics almost like Vladimir Putin's propaganda of, see, the West is has no values worth saving, therefore it's all just a camouflage for power, and therefore that there's a kind of weird mirror image between those two yeah. perspectives. I'd say their motivations are slightly different. I think the, the, the anti-war left hates Western values and hates the West. Uh, and so to them, any challenge to that is to be sympathized with. And this was the case during the Cold War. There were people on the left who were very pro-Soviet, who holidayed in the Soviet Union while our people were starving. They were given these Potemkin sort of village tours of the country, in which they thought it was all great and wonderful. And that was because, you know, in every society, there are going to be people who despise that society and think other societies which they don't understand are better, just because the grass is greener and whatever. On the right, I don't think they hate Western society. What they hate is the establishment. Now, over the last six or seven years, Brexit, Trump, COVID, the, the attempted re-election of Trump, all of that, they have been, <clears throat> some of them feel, and I, in my opinion correctly, that they've been lied to, they've been sneered at, they've been dismissed when they've raised legitimate concerns, they've been told you know, you're just a stupid, thick racist, get back in your box. And as a result, they now hate the establishment. And therefore, anything that comes out the establishment is to be rejected, is to be denied, is to be questioned. And when, when I say questioned, I don't mean legitimate questioning. I mean a sort of nihilistic cynicism about things, which is why you've seen a portion of this sort of dissident um, <coughs> populist right now getting into a position where having been called Nazis themselves for six years with no evidence whatsoever, they now readily believe that Ukraine is full of Nazis. And the only reason President Zelensky is in power is of a coup. They don't even know that there was a president in between who was voted out uh, in a free and fair election by people mostly in the pro-Russian, supposedly pro-Russian, eastern regions and central regions of Ukraine. So um, there is a, a willingness to buy these arguments, I think, because people are really fed up of uh, the establishment as they see it. And that, to me, is as, as damaging as the sort of just generalized anti-Western sentiment on the left. And what is that? I mean, you hinted at parts of that narrative, the sort of Ukraine is full of Nazis. Um, what, what is that narrative that's gaining current, currency that you think? And what's the truth of that from your perspective? Where it's wrong is it completely misrepresents what's happening. It's attempting to pin the blame on what's happening for Ukraine. It's attempting to misrepresent the difficult and complicated history of Ukraine and the fact that in a particular part of Western Ukraine, which wasn't even part of Ukraine until World War II, it's a long story about Stepan Bandera and the organization of Ukrainian nationalists who were 100% fascists. 
they were fascists and not because they were collaborators with Nazis. No, no, if you go and read the founding documents of the organization, they read like Hitler's doctrine about how a country should be run. One strong leader, uh, complete uh, absence of morality, everything is about the needs of the state. They were fascists. Uh, they were like 1% of the, of the total population in the area in which they were operating, which was a tiny part of Ukraine at the time. And yes, historically speaking, Ukraine, a country that doesn't have many national heroes, doesn't have a coherent national myth, Mistakes have been made in attempting to build a national identity for Ukraine since the collapse of the Soviet Union by embracing some of these figures. And there may even have been an element of that which was like a bit of an FU to Russia going, well, you hate us. Well, here's a guy that fought against you, right? Uh, so mistakes have been made, you know, p sort of f fringing the Russian language, at least politically speaking. There wasn't any of this like over discrimination against Russian speakers that people in the West who don't speak either language like to bang on about. I'm a Russian speaker. A lot of my family in Ukraine are Russian speakers. All of them are uh, pro-Ukrainian. I have some distant family also who are pro-Russian Russian speakers, but even they wouldn't claim that they were being di discriminated against for their language. They've got other concerns. Um, so I think this narrative is just a fiction that people, particularly in America, seem to want to weave because I think they're concerned that American troops will yet again be sent into a country they can't find on a map, that people are going to die, that, you know, that they're being misled, that their elites are now got another quote unquote distraction while they're Im implementing uh, scary COVID regulations and whatever, which is a concern and should be a concern to people. These just things that just aren't connected, you know. And I mean, I find it really interesting that even Putin is now, to some degree, trying to kind of wrap himself in kind of anti-woke language, mm -hmm. saying that the West is trying to cancel Russia. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about, you know, gender fluidity, and, and he has been for a long time. And he's right. The West is destroying itself with all of this nonsense. Uh, but of course, that doesn't mean that we should all worship at the feet of Vladimir Putin, right? Like Hitler was a vegetarian. It's, it's that eternal argument. But it's also a dangerous... I find it a very dangerous sort of path to start going down. Like the extreme identity politics conversation goes too far. But Putin is not just anti kind of pronoun pronouns in the military or whatever. He's also against homosexuality. Mm. He's also sees like that you'd have to be more than just anti woke. You'd have to be kind of homophobic and anti kind of any of the kind of the gay rights or the women's rights movement since the sixties. I can't, can't think of that many people who would kind of identify or we'd identify as anti-woke who'd go that far to push back oh, against no, those. Completely. I'm not saying he's right about everything yeah. he says. I think he's right to say that the wokeness is not helpful to the West and that as a leader of a country, he is right to try and protect his people from that. I don't think that's what he's doing in Ukraine or anywhere else for that matter. I think he's pursuing a completely different agenda, but he's not wrong. And, and if we are going to give him that open goal, he's going he's gonna to score. Right. So that's why I've been a vocal critic of all this stuff in the West, because I've been making this point for a long time, including on your program, David, which is if we destroy our civilization from the inside, there's going to be people who are going to try and take advantage of it. But yeah, so he's correct. That does not mean we should all embrace Vladimir Putin. He's just saying an obvious truth that a lot of us who are, I would say, slightly more balanced than Vladimir Putin have been saying for some time. Yeah. And... There's a, there's a really interesting. Um, are you familiar with Vladimir Surkov and the yes. whole yeah the whole that kind of whole history Peter Pomerantsev wrote about in uh, Nothing Is True and Everything Is Possible mm -hmm. about that a lot of the Russian mentality the Russian propaganda it's not necessarily about trying to persuade you that something false is true mm -hmm. it's about destroying the very idea of truth. Um, there's a famous quote by um, Hannah Arendt that. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or dedicated communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, no longer ex exists. Mm. And that, for me, encapsulates something very important about the kind of the, the information warfare that we're seeing at the moment. It's not necessarily so much. It's about how a lot of it is how much can you destroy the idea of truth itself? Mm. How much can you destroy the idea of anything being true? And then in a way, you'll if you destroy truth, you're left in. A kind of environment like well, might makes right. Whoever whoever is has the power is in charge, and there's almost no way of opposing that because there's no there's no solid ground to build on. I agree with you. 
Uh, at the risk of you accusing me of throat clearing, uh, I hold the mainstream media of Western countries almost entirely responsible for that, uh, for that destruction of faith and trust and respect, uh, because they lied to us repeatedly. They tried to get us to believe things that weren't true. When you look down your nose at half the country for voting in a way that you didn't agree with, uh, and you try and destroy their livelihoods and you try and destroy their reputations and anyone who speaks for them, you're going to get to a position where people no longer believe you. And yeah, they're going to be very vulnerable to other, other, you know, people who they consider credible. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I agree with you in terms of where we are. But I think it's very important to acknowledge that we are here for very precise reasons, very specific reasons that don't really have much to do with Russia. Like, I get that it's comforting to think that, you know, Yuri Bezmenov and all of this stuff, the demoralization of the West, some guys from the Soviet Union in the 80s who did all this. And I'm sure they tried. But no, we did this to ourselves. And we have to take responsibility for that and start asking questions about how do we get trust back? And to me, I mean, it seems at least part of that would be to tell the truth. Uh, the problem we've got to, and it's a, it's a very big problem, is that even when you tell the truth now, a lot of people won't hear it. Uh, and that's a worry. And so, yeah, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, obviously, with my work in terms of my substack and trigonometry and my you know commentary elsewhere, I try to give people what I understand as the truth about what's happening. And I've been pretty, I think, as you've noticed, pretty direct about it. And I don't care who, who, who is uncomfortable with that. I, I try to just explain to people what's going on as best I can. And that's what we're all going to have to do. How, how, well, you know, I, I was about to say, well, how do we rebuild trust in institutions? I don't think they're worthy of that trust yet. So I don't think it's worth rebuilding that trust. They need to become worthy of the trust. And then if, if I thought the BBC and ITV and GB News and all the other mainstream channels were saying things which were accurately representing reality and were being fair and balanced, I'd be the first person shouting, going, guys, guys, forget trigonometry, go watch the... B well, I wouldn't be quite like that, but I'd be like, go watch the BBC as well. I'm not there yet. I'm not seeing that truthfulness. I'm not seeing the balance. I'm not seeing the fairness on many issues. Uh, and so... You know, I, I'm not at the point where I'm like, yeah, let's rebuild trust in things that I don't trust. You know, and that's, you know, I was I was invited to talk at a at a school yesterday last night. Francis and I were talking at, a, at an elite school, and this was the point that I made. It's like you guys are going to have to solve this problem. It's it's not going to be people of our generation. This is a problem that's going to run and run, man. Yeah, and you talked about kind of the the lack of trust in the institutions. In a way, it's difficult to trust an institution. It's a lot easier to trust. A person mm. potentially, and I think you've built up a lot of trust because people have shown, people have seen that you're willing. Like I've seen you, particularly during this time, you've talked about things that you've got wrong. You've talked about kind of uh, where you miscalibrated earlier in the time, and then you like that. That's the sort of stuff that I think is is of immense value, and then it's difficult for an institution to do that. And maybe it? I think it's more difficult for an institution. Why? Why, to do why that. can't the newspaper come out and say, "Look, last week we ran an article, but actually." we realized that was a mistake and here's the fact of this. Why can't they do that? I was, I was bringing it back to the personal because I feel like it's yeah. more easy for people to connect with individuals. Connect, yes. I guess I was trying to say, I, I wonder if it's going to be possible for the, the, the trust gap to be bridged by institutions. Whereas I think we're now, we're now like Joe, look at Joe Rogan. Mm. Joe Rogan has now become like the most influential broadcaster because people can see, they believe that they don't necessarily trust everything that he says, but they believe that he's telling them what he thinks. He thinks he's authentic. What he thinks. He's authentic. And I feel like that's kind of... I, I, I wonder if that's where the trust vortex has to be or the trust kind of gap has to be reestablished is through those individual relationships and seeing people, individuals going through that process, which is why I... Yeah, I, I found it very interesting seeing that you... What I understand through this is that you've started to become a bit more critical of people who you might consider on your own side mm. like because i i've been critical in the past of the the mainstream media i come from it a lot of a lot of rebel wisdom's content has been talking about kind of the failures of the mainstream but i became more and more concerned over the last couple of years of the failures of the alternative as well partly because i feel it on myself like do i self-censor youtube leans quite conspiratorial 
I don't lean that conspiratorial. I look into that stuff and I'm like, actually, it doesn't really add up. But I know when I put that stuff out on the channel, it's going to get a lot of response. And I worry about kind of even self-censoring myself, but I'm kind of try to, to push through that. Um, so yeah, I'm worried about those, those factors as well. If you're going to kind of try and orient towards truth, then do you self-censor? And I, and I guess that you, on this topic in particular, you've kind of ended up in a different place to a lot of the kind of contrarian, populist right um, that maybe, maybe make up a, a big part of the audience who like hearing what you say about kind of the, the woke left. You know, I'll be honest with you, you and I have had this conversation many times privately about pushing against what you expect, what your audience thinks. I have a... Trim- you've got a thicker skin than I do. I'm a, Probably. Like, from your comedy background and yeah, stuff. And yeah, yeah. I don't think it's about it so much as skin, to be honest, or thickness of skin, although I think that's probably part, partly a factor. I have a tremendous amount of respect, as I define it, for my audience. And what that means is in the same way with friendship, like you and I are friends. And when you say something that I don't agree with, what do I usually do? I immediately tell you what I hope is a respectful and and polite way, right? I think... For a Russian. For a Russian, exactly. (laughs) You're wrong. Um, But, you know, I feel that my audience, the people who watch our show, are people who are capable of understanding that we're not always going to agree, but that I am treating them with extra respect by saying the truth as I see it, even though I know that they, some of them might not like it. Now, obviously, that's an idealistic way of thinking. There's always going to be a small minority of people who, who, who are, uh, for various reasons, just going to react in a certain way. But I never really see them as representative of our audience. One of the great things about trigonometry is we get to meet our fans. We've done live shows where hundreds of people have come. Uh, we've, we do calls with our top-level supporters. We do one-on-one calls with our very top-level supporters. So I get a sense of who, who are the people that feel really passionate about trigonometry. And 95% of those people are really, really, really curious people who are open-minded, who are smart, who don't expect you to agree with them on everything, and who respect our ethos of trigonometry, which is trying to pursue the truth as we understand it. And sometimes we'll land on an issue that they agree with and sometimes not. And also, you know, we'll hear their feedback. And if it's valid, we will amend our view of the world too. Like we had one of our top supporters come around to our studio the other day, which is one of the things we do. Uh, We were having dinner and he made some points. And I was arguing with him, as I always do, trying to push and challenge and find that, you know. And then he went away and I talked to some other people. And then I was like, I called him up the next day and I was like, you know what? I thought you made some good points. And now I see this in a, in a slightly different way. So all I ever say to people is I'm going to say what I think when I think it based on what I know. And if that changes, I'll let you know, you know. And I, I've never, I've always believed that there's an audience out there that wants that. And if it's smaller than an audience for con- engaging in conspiracy stuff, well, then it's smaller. I, you know, even with my comedy, I never really wanted to, I never wanted to be the most popular comedian. I wanted to be a comedian who did the comedy that I wanted to do. And if that meant it was three people that were interested, I was, I wasn't happy with that, but I'd rather live that than sell my soul and be something I'm not. Yeah. And with the sort of different narrative warfare, you've, got into, we can talk maybe about a couple of examples, you've got into a few kind of Twitter spats with people pushing more kind of contrarian uh, narratives. Mm. Um, why do you think they've got such, well, you've sort, you've already talked about why you think they've got such um, traction, but why do you think in particular, do you think it's partly to do with COVID and people sort of having been kind of that having sort of stretched the, the landscape an awful lot and now people are looking for kind of anything that, that contra- contrasts with the kind of mainstream narrative? Well, we talked about why they've got the traction, why they're doing... Are you asking me why I think they're doing it or why, why it's landing? Or... Yeah, well, let's, let's talk a bit about your Substack piece that yeah. you just put out, um, which is... Yeah, what, what, do you, what have you said in that? Well, it's called The Age of Religion is Upon Us. And what I'm talking about is that we seem to be in a place where we are heading into a new dark age because in a society in which there's an abundance of information but very few people are able to have 
enough context to process new information critically because critical thinking isn't going some you saying the sky is blue and going fuck you no it's it's that's that's the mainstream narrative and actually it's the global whatever to whatever that's not critical thinking critical thinking is taking a piece of information that is new and analyzing it internally in terms of its internal logic but also comparing it to the to the knowledge that you already have and you've like gone okay i know this is true right uh, so critical thinking doesn't exist in a vacuum. And that means you have to have a solid grounding in, in, in what you think the world looks like already before you can process new information. And a lot of people on the issue of Ukraine, you just see it, they, 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 weren't, they didn't know where Ukraine was three weeks ago. And now they're giving very strongly held views about that issue. And that to me was like a, a cause for pause. Um, and I think that we've got into a place where there's a sort of primitive culty religiousness that exists now where it's like there's air, raindrops falling from the air. We have displeased the, the, the God of the skies. In the same way, it's like everything has a human explanation. It's a very, you talked about it in your religion piece, it's a very utopian worldview and, and it's from both sides. The sort of woke left view is, well, if we could just get rid of the, the racist, sexist, homophobic, whatever, and the isms, the, 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 the systemic problems, then the world would be perfect, right? And, and the sort of contrarian right-wing point of view now seems to be, well, you know, if we could get rid of, I don't know, Klaus Schwab or whoever it is that's supposed to be, and Bill Gates and whoever is supposed to be running the world, then, then the world would be, you know, all of these problems would be gone. Uh, I don't have that much faith in humans. You know, as someone who runs a small organization of like nine employees, I can tell you, we, we, we can barely get an episode out, you know, that, that's in line with what I want. How do you organize a global conspiracy to, to whatever? Um, so I think we are returning to a kind of religious situation. And, and, and I, this isn't to like besmirch the good things about religion. I think there are some very valuable things about religion as a non-believer. But th this primitive religiousness is coming back. And I think it's because the abundance of information, social media, all of these things, that they're, they're causing our brains to be warped in quite uh, a, a dangerous way. And the big challenge for us going forward, I think, is going to be what you guys call sense-making, which, you know, I'm not clever enough to, to use words like that. But just what I, I see is we're going to have to work out what's, what's true and what's not, what to believe and what not to believe. And um, I think a lot of people are struggling with that now. Yeah, I think the religious framing is really useful because it's almost like it's an archetypal, it's, it's deep kind of language within us, like archetypal language. And it's like, like you say, like Klaus Schwab has become this kind of new figure, Bill Gates. And for me, it's kind of a religious frame because it's like you start seeing them as almost like literally Satan. And there is, there is this kind of archetypal language that then just gets mapped onto the world and I've, I've kind of also said that conspiracy is a difficult word to talk about. People get very upset when you talk about it because a conspiracy, like there are conspiracies all the time, obviously. Some of them have been uncovered, but there is a, there is a fundamental difference between a conspiracy that is like there are these people that acted in this particular way and the whole thing is a conspiracy. And there's a, there's a kind of clear dividing line, but it's all covered under the same word. And that for me is the religious phenomenon. That's when you get into the, the world of religion, where you start losing your ground, you start seeing things as being, and it's, a, it's ultimately, you don't need to think anymore, because everything fits into this, like, let's, let's take James Lindsay as an example, like, he's even denying everything that's going on in Ukraine, because it's part of the same conspiracy, for example. Mm. Um, he's, he's kind of an extreme example, but there are, there are a lot of people, like, conspiracy theorists never, is never stuck for an explanation of what's going on. They no. know exactly what's going on. And look, the thing with conspiracy theories is you've got to be honest, they're, they're fun. I love a good conspiracy theory. I'll happily, uh, I happily watch, you know, sit at home on a Saturday, Sunday night or whatever and watch a bit of David Icke talking about 9-11. Doesn't mean I believe David Icke, but it is quite entertaining. It's enjoyable. It's fun. Uh, I don't have a problem. I, I don't think people should be shut down or prevented from saying things that are of that nature. The, the, you mentioned James, and you, James is someone I, I like, and well, I used to like anyway. I just, it was quite a shock to me to watch this guy who doesn't know anything about Ukraine suddenly make everything in Ukraine about his pet 
thing. Um, I found that very odd. And and my worry with James is, and you know, him and I had a falling out, and that's fine. I, I, I a lot of people reached out to me afterwards and basically kind of said he's not very well. And 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 I wish maybe I'd acted differently if I'd known that because I was quite hostile with him because I just I think he what he's doing is damaging, and I still think that. But if I'd if I'd known that he was just struggling, I, I might have been a bit. I, I might have chosen my words differently. My concern with people like that is what they're doing is they're destroying people's reality, uh, which, again, I don't think they're solely responsible for. I think the mainstream media had a lot of responsibility for that. But I, I also think that when you are uh, breaking people's view of the world, you have to encourage them and yourself, and this is really important, to try and come up with a framework that is accurate as opposed to a framework that is convenient or makes you feel good. And that's my concern with a lot of this stuff is like it's the God in the sky who's making this happen or the Satan in the sky more appropriately instead of looking at the complexities of the world. And the world is much more complicated than that. Um, <clears throat> and James is someone who has, you know, he's done some great work. He's on, he earned a lot of goodwill from people. And it just it, it's it's uh, unfortunate that, in my opinion, he's not only squandering that, but he's doing a lot of damage to people's perceptions of reality. And we're all going to be that's a problem, as I talked about earlier, in terms of having to work that out. But I don't think he's being a, a constructive. Uh, he's not playing a constructive role in that process. So that's that's why I I was quite direct about calling him out on that. Uh, and it's there's no personal animosity there. I just I I think what he's doing is really really damaging to people. Yeah. Before we started recording, you made a really good point about, and it's sort of G.K. Chesterton's quote: uh, "When a man stops believing in God, he'll believe in anything." It also applies to when you when you kind of see through some of the kind of manipulations of the mainstream, the kind of like the red pill phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Often you'll kind of collapse into a viewpoint on the other side. Mm -hmm. And the the difficulty, it's like when you realize that a lot of what you took for, for granted, which is a kind of spiritual process as well. I mean, we, you've also done a fair bit of kind of personal growth work, like that kind of awakening process of realizing a lot of things that you thought were true were not true. It's a dangerous place because then you just fall into, you can easily just replace it with another worldview and attach to that just as strongly. Whereas what we actually need to do is to kind of learn to navigate in uncertainty, learn to navigate and to hold different perspectives more lightly and understand that there are different parts of truth within all of them. But that's a difficult process to go through. If you think about the Matrix, where a lot of the terminology comes from, the first Matrix movie, I mean, one of the things they talk about extensively is how you don't really bring people out of blue pill world once they're adults and they make an exception for Neo. And then they have to hold his hand as he readjusts himself to this different reality. The world of blue pill is very comfortable. And once you come out of that, it's a very disorienting experience. And the red pill world is full of, you know, potential dangers and, and mis being misled and, and leaning into things too heavily that maybe you ought not to have done. And we all went through it, I think, during COVID particularly. I think COVID broke a lot of people's brains. And frankly, if it wasn't for the, if I was doing trigonometry by myself, I probably would have gone off the deep end as well. It was the fact that Francis and our producer Anton and we were constantly, you know, having conversations about it. Um, <clears throat> it kept us all sane. But what was happening during COVID was so extraordinarily ridiculous that I think it was perfectly understandable that a lot of people felt that a perf extraordinarily ridiculous problem requires an extraordinarily ridiculous explanation. I'm not someone who goes to protests or whatever, but I was out there protesting against vaccine mandates and vaccine passports. Not because I'm some wacko anti-lockdown person. It's just like, I was, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're forcing people to inject stuff in their body that they don't want for the greater good. That's what we're doing in, in the liberal democracy in the 21st. Hold on a second, there's something wrong here. And so, yeah, it's very tempting in that situation to go, Holy shit, like on this and that. And, and is it a social credit system? And, and maybe that's partly part of it still. I don't, I don't know what I think about that. I'm concerned about that. So yeah, in a situation where awful, ridiculous, crazy things are happening, which 
affect your own personal moral sensibilities if you're pro-freedom and pro-choice in every way and whatever. People like me, that, 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 that's going to scare the shit out of you. And when you're scared, you are going to be tempted to accept explanations that may not be true. So I think that's a big part of it too. And the thing that I've been uh, very impressed by and it was, it was actually interesting when I was listening to you early in the early in the um, invasion. I think it was maybe on unheard. Mm. You said just sort of quite strongly and definitively, "Our values are better." Mm. And I was like, "Oh, we we just don't hear that very often." In a way, I think partly that we've lost faith in our own values to a large degree, and partly because I think they are being kind of criticised and undermined on both sides of the of the spectrum. Mm. And that was a a relief to to hear. Yeah, I, I think our values are better. And, you know, when I was a comedian, uh, one of the things I used to say, even as a throwaway comment, really, is I'd say, I love this country, and I say so publicly, which is how you know I'm not really British. That's kind of the position we've got to, is the only person who can say Britain's a good country and Western values and British values are good values is an immigrant. That's kind of where we are. Um, and that's a big concern, man. That's a big, big concern. And it's been a concern of mine for many years. Um, now, there's an argument to be had about whether we should be imposing our values in other countries. That's a different discussion. Uh, my concern is we have to be super confident in ourselves and the value of who we are. Uh, and be, you know, the, look, people don't like hearing this, but the West is a beacon of light to many people around the world. Now, I'm not saying every single Russian in Siberia is sitting there thinking, oh, I, I really want to li live in a liberal democracy. But that's because a lot of them have no idea what a liberal democracy looks like, right? Uh, to them, liberal democracy is what Russia went through in the 90s, an awful, unstable, terrible time in which a bunch of crooks ended up with all of the, the wealth of the nation. But given the opportunity, most people would prefer to live in the way that we live than, than, than the way that they live now in Russia or China or, or everywhere else if they could actually experience it. So, yeah, of course our values are better. And uh, I don't think that we do our values justice by going around invading other countries, which is why I oppose the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan and all the other military interventions, because we undermine those very values by trying to spread democracy by bombing people. That doesn't seem to work to me. Uh, but that doesn't mean our values aren't better. And this is where I think a lot of the conflicts come out, because it's like either... You think the West should be strong and capable and confident and therefore invade loads of countries. That, that tag on, I don't understand why it's there. Or you think we're awful and we should just, you know, like one of our sort of anti-war leftist guests from a while ago said, America is the Death Star. Like, I don't think that's true either. And I think the truth is we need to be confident about who we are. We need to recapture the sense of what makes us free and valuable in the world. And yeah, I don't, I don't think we should be sticking our nose into everybody else's business. But given the option, a lot of people would like to live in a society that we would like to live in. And you see Ukrainians are now giving their lives in order to do that. And do you think there's a danger, because you're very aware of the danger from the, the kind of far left mm. of undermining Western values and just mm. saying it's, it's all bullshit, it's all just a power game. Are you aware and wary of the same thing on the other side? Like if you get the kind of, if the anti-woke criticism goes too far, then you basically end up in the same place. Well, actually, Western values have now been completely hollowed out to the point where we might as well uh, pack it up and, and, and start again. I don't frame it in that way because I don't think that it's... The, is that not partly what you're reacting against? No, I, it is. But let me explain what I mean. So... I don't frame it in the way of like, well, the woke people are doing this and the anti-woke people are doing this and that's what's going to cause. What I see is the attempt to destroy Western values from the far left is provoking people. And of course, my biggest fear of the, of the far left and the woke left isn't them. They're a bunch of idiots. They're not going to organize anything ever. They're not going to overthrow anything or whatever. But what they will do is they will irritate enough people with their rhetoric, demonizing men, demonizing white people, demonizing anyone, all of that. That will provoke a reaction. I, I hope it, it doesn't happen. But that's, to me, a much bigger concern than, uh, than anything else. So I, might, I, I don't frame it quite in the way of like, well, there's woke people, anti-woke people, they're both as bad as each other. I do see this issue as being driven by the woke people and encouraging people into the arms of some very nasty people who will come out on the other side. 
That I've always made that point. I've always made that point. Um, that's why, for example, as an immigrant, I always try and talk rationally about immigration. Because if, if you try to rub people's noses in diversity, a quote from a Blair speechwriter, you're going to piss people off. And I think they need to hear that there's immigrants that don't, don't buy into that narrative, that don't think unlimited, unchecked, uncontrolled immigration is good for society, that don't think endless diversity drives are a good thing. You know, I, I don't think diversity is our strength. Diversity is, a, is an agenda with trade-offs. It offers some things that are beneficial. It offers some things that are very damaging. And, and like with anything else, if you push things to extremes, you're going to get a nasty backlash. And that's what I'm worried about. And where are you at the moment with the, with the conflict? Where have you ended up now? For people who weren't aware of it, basically, we initially thought of raising money to help Ukraine's defense fund. Uh, and then I changed my mind and I talked to the guys and we changed our mind collectively about making sure that money went to humanitarian purposes. And we kind of had to uh, do a bit of a mea culpa with our audience and say, look, guys, you've raised this money for this purpose, but actually we're asking you to let us donate it to another cause or we'll, we'll give you a refund. And a, a small handful of people wanted their money to go to Ukraine's defense rather than humanitarian causes. Where I am with the war is that I am, I, I'm not making any predictions but I'm deeply concerned that the only thing that would stop Ukraine from losing the war would be Western interference, which the West won't give and shouldn't give, because that would start World War III. It absolutely would. And in that situation, if you care about people's lives, not a, a country on a map, but people's lives, you know, it's, it's not unreasonable, in my opinion, to think that extending the conflict will not change the outcome, but will create more bitterness and more acrimony for generations and more people will die. So um, I am not claiming that Ukraine will lose the war, but militarily, if you look on the map, not, not the sort of like pretty seven-year-old running away from Russian bombs on BBC News, but the actual reality. And if you talk to people who are aware of the military side of things, Yes, Russia's advance is stalling and they're really struggling and they've got morale problems and they've got supply problems and they've got all sorts of other issues. And Ukrainians are incredibly brave and putting up an incredible fight. And if I was in Ukraine and if I were Ukrainian, I'd be doing what those brave men are doing. That's what I'd be out there doing my part, whether that would be on the front line or in journalism or whatever. I'd be fighting for my country. I have no issue with them doing that. I support them completely. But as an outsider, looking at it from the outside, I'm concerned that it's not a fight they're going to win. Uh, and all they will do by putting up a more fierce resistance potentially is provoke Putin into using more destructive tactics, more destructive weapons. So I personally don't want to contribute to that if that's going to happen, which is why the fundraiser we did, I prefer it to go to helping veterans and, and helping people fleeing the conflict. Um, but look, this is a difficult question. Uh, it's a question for the people of Ukraine. I just look at the reality. The West isn't going to close the skies, as the Ukrainians call it. The West isn't going to, you know, we saw Poland try to give its planes to Ukraine. President Biden stopped that from happening. So in that situation, uh, my focus is on protecting people in Ukraine. Uh, and I understand people who disagree with that, and I respect that completely, but that's my honest take on it at the moment. Yeah, I had a drink with a former um, colleague at Channel 4 News who was saying that he felt like the, the Ukrainians should surrender now to, to basically stop the... Because as we know from what happened in Syria, the Russians will kind of ramp up their attacks. They, they will continue until... The, the cities are raised. They also did in Chechnya. So, but it's an impo it's an impossible thing to to talk about from the outside. I have Ukrainian friends there who say, "Yes, this is painful, but it's the baptism of Ukraine as a nation. Like yeah. this is this is the blood sacrifice that creates Ukraine as a nation." That's why I don't I don't tell my Ukrainian family or friends this point of view. I if they want to fight, that's I totally get that. And I don't think it should be for us here to sit in the comfortable London studio to be telling Ukrainians to surrender. Like I, like I say, if, if my home was under attack, you better believe I'd be out there with an AK-47. Yeah. 
And there's one point that we've disagreed on mm. privately mm. about the kind of counterfactual if Trump had mm. been president. Mm. And you said that you thought this wouldn't have happened if Trump was president. Mm. I initially said that I, I thought it would mm. um, for reasons which I'll, I'll explain, but I've actually changed my mind. And I, I, I think it probably would. the dark side. It probably wouldn't. <laughs> but Why may, do you but love may, Trump so much, David? Yeah, but maybe not for the same reasons that you do. <laughs> That's fine, as long as you agree that I was right. As long as I agree that you were right. Um, so my, I mean, do you want to say, give your argument of why you think it wouldn't have happened if Trump was I think charge? Trump was, uh, he understood how the real world works. Uh, he would have undoubtedly, first of all, he was far more unpredictable than the current people in charge. Uh, and so Putin would have been far more fearful of his potential irrationality even or unpredictability. I think Donald Trump had absolutely no problem with wielding power uh, and bullying people. Uh, and on the international stage, that's what you need. You need someone who's going to you know, put his foot down. Uh, I also think that he was actually much stronger than Obama or Biden in terms of arming the Ukrainians. We saw that, right? He was the one president that actually sent them weapons. Um, so from that perspective as well, I don't think that uh, him being in power would have made it worse. Now, look, it's a, it's a, it's a, hypothetical. I can't know. But instinctively, that's definitely my feeling about it. Um, yeah, that, that's basically the, the crux of it. Yeah, so my counterfactual was that, like, he's definitely a much more unpredictable person. He wouldn't, and that may have stayed Putin's hand to some degree. But I also think it would have been equally likely that in the run up to it, Putin, Putin, they had a lot of conversations off the record conversations. And in the past, a lot of Trump's advisors and people around him were increasingly worried that he was basically repeating Putin's talking points. Right. I'll, I'll put a link to a Bulwark article about it in the show notes below. But about Montenegro, he started kind of talking about, well, we shouldn't be defending Montenegro. Why would we do that? Right. And they were like, where did this come from? It, it clearly came from the conversation he had with Putin. Right. A couple of other issues where he started saying things there was a possibility, like he was very anti-NATO as well. Mm -hmm. Like he was very skeptical about NATO. There was some suggestions he was even thinking about pulling out of NATO in his second term. Well, he did demand that NATO fund itself, which sure. Germany has now done. Yeah, right? the 2% thing, And he for demanded sure. that Germany doesn't sign the pipeline deal with Russia, which it did under Joe Biden, right? So while you can argue about that side of it, the fact is, in terms of his actions, right, he was not pro-Russian. People like to think that. Now, look, you, go listen to someone like Vladimir Pozner, for example. He talks about this. Like, of course, people in Russia want someone like Trump in power because they want someone who's going to talk to them instead of instead of just uh, imposing their agenda on them. Someone who understands the negotiation process. I mean, I think even Trump's worst critics would agree that that was a strength of his. And this is where we get into my slightly personal criticism, which is I think a lot of people in your position just don't want to let go of their deep, deep uh, to Donald Trump. No, I, I disagree. I think I think you have an image of international relations that's sort of almost like great man theory of, of international relations, mm -hmm. which is obviously some truth to it. But I think Trump would have struggled to, the West would have been much less united in a response to, to Putin invading Ukraine if it had happened with Trump in power, given the, 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 the way that Trump felt about NATO, I have come around to the, the idea that I think Putin probably wouldn't have invaded Ukraine if Trump was in power, but mostly because I don't think he'd have needed to. Like, Trump was doing a lot of the things that he needed, that he wanted Trump to do. Like what? Undermine NATO, be very kind of, be very, he, distro he well, largely then, destroyed. That's, that's counter to what I've just said. He, he tried to get NATO to invest more money in defending itself. I, yeah, of course, he was America first. But in the context of NATO, his argument wasn't, well, we're just going to go. His argument was, we're not going to defend you unless you defend yourself too. That was his argument. That was part of his argument. Yeah. I'm not sure it was the whole of his argument. I think he genuinely... Well, you think he just wanted I think to he collapse NATO? I think he couldn't really see the point of it. Like, he, he is very individualistic. He's very egotistical. I just don't think he understood the, the benefits of NATO to the US. Why, what, what benefit would it be to the US? Like you've got obligations to all of these other countries, whereas you've got the biggest military in the world. Why would you, what, what possible reason would you have as a, from an American perspective of being involved in this 
He didn't want America to be the world policeman. I think you would have seen a continued kind of retrenchment of America. And I, I also just have this, I think it's, it's equally likely that he put up a fight for Ukraine as he got off the phone from Putin and said, well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Texas. Why, why, why shouldn't Putin have the right to, it's part of Russia anyway. Could you, could you not visualize that, him coming out and sort of saying, well, Putin has the right to, to Ukraine. Why should we get involved? And I think then it would have been, so my fear, and again, these are counterfactuals we don't know. We're weighing up kind of like, I think maybe like 70% here, you think 70% here. But my feeling is like he would, I think it's just equally likely that he would have ended up kind of supporting Putin in invading Ukraine. And then we'd be in a very different situation. I think we would have seen a much greater split of the Western response because I don't think he believed in diplomacy. I think he did have more, maybe more of a kind of realist perspective of we need to kind of punch our weight on the, on the global stage. But I don't think he saw any of the benefits of multilateral diplomacy. And you've got to have, I think you've got to have both. You can't only have one without the other if you're not prepared to defend your, your, your values, but you can't only have the other with, if you're going to piss off every, all of your potential allies. Well, there's a lot in there. I, first of all, I have no idea what you mean by multilateral diplomacy. Look, the, the world works... What we're seeing at the moment, like coordinated action. No, sanctions. no, that's not what we're seeing. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing a strong response that wouldn't be strong if America went, you know what, we don't give a shit. You wouldn't see the response that you're seeing now. Look, David, sure, NATO and UN and everything works on a very simple basis. The Americans decide what's going to happen. They try to bring a few other big players along so that they've got cover, which is why they fought so hard to get France and Germany on board with the war in Iraq. But really, the Americans are deciding what's happened, right? So I, I don't know what you mean exactly by multilateral. Look, well, sanctions, but that's not strictly true because with sanctions especially, yeah. it isn't, America doesn't have a huge amount of trade with, no. with, with Russia. No. So it is getting other countries on board to like that's where diplomacy comes in. Sanctions but that's not diplomacy. That's Americans telling the Germans and the British and the French and the whoever you better you better deal with this. I disagree. I mean, we've got our own. Like the British aren't being told by 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 America. We've got our own reasons. Probably more reason than America has to mm. to act against against Putin. Like we've had British citizens killed on British soil by Putin's death squads. Yeah. Like, and I think many of the other countries have got their own reasons to be concerned if about Russia. I think the British government cares about one Russian guy being murdered by Putin in Britain. I think you're misunderstanding the scale of this. Well, I think they don't like, have, have, having your own people killed in your country, like that as a breach of sovereignty, that's a huge issue. What's your evidence for, for them caring about it? Two people have been murdered in this country, allegedly, by Vladimir Putin's yeah. uh, security services. Inclu including a British citizen. Including a British citizen. What yeah. was the response to that? Did we introduce sanctions? Yes. What, what sanctions? Yeah, we try. And we try to get more, more um, actions against Russia as well and largely failed. But yeah, do we give a shit? Yes, we definitely do give a shit. I don't think we give a shit at all. Not at the level of government. Of course we do. I haven't We've seen got... any evidence for it. And and look, maybe at the at the level of the nation, that's the right decision. Like that, I, that's why I don't. Well, we're not going to go to war over it. That's the that's the. And truth. we're not going to go to economic war for, over it. I think we did impose quite a lot of sanctions. Oh, come on, come on. We didn't even introduce significant sanctions in 2014 when Putin annexed Crimea and the two eastern regions. Yeah, but that's different from your own, from someone breaching your own sovereignty and killing people within your own country. What would have happened if we'd done that to to Russians? Uh, I don't know. I suspect the argument from Russia would be that we regularly do it to Russians. They would argue. I don't know if it's true, but that... No, it wouldn't be polonium. They just have a heart attack or something like that. I, look, I don't know. But we're getting into very weird territory here. All I'm saying is I don't think we particularly care about individuals. I think America is dictating what happens one way or another. And I think the reason, you know, I gave you the reasons about Trump. And look, I'm sorry, but I come back to what I said, which is I think a lot of metropolitan sort of liberal people like me and you are deeply uncomfortable with Donald Trump because of the way that he spoke and the way that he behaved and the way that he came across. And that bleeds into our analysis of what he might have done. That's my uh, very strong feeling. It's a feeling about this conversation. I, I, think, I, think, I think I can look at Trump's kind of value and tendencies opposed from what I personally believe about Donald Trump. I think he was, I think he had a more realistic view of the world than a lot of the sort of Democrat, mm. kind of more sort of globalist um, contingency. 
but in terms of action in the world, I think he, I think because he was such a divisive figure, he was actually less equipped than Biden has proved in the aftermath of the invasion, because I don't think he would have been able to coordinate that kind of response. I don't think he'd have been interested in doing it. I don't think he'd have, he'd have been able to, I don't think it would have been anywhere near as such a unified front as we've seen after the invasion. Uh, that may be true, but I'm not interested in the unified front. I'm interested in the outcome. And what I'm saying is that uh, the outcome would have been different. Uh, whether the French and the Germans can hold hands and get together, I'm less I think it would have, yeah, I agree it would have been different. But, but I also think the why I agree with you that I don't think it would happen under Trump is I don't think Putin would have felt the need to change the geopolitical balance by invading Ukraine if Trump had still been in power. I think he would have seen that as things are, are still trending in his direction. Because I think Trump's, a lot of Trump's foreign policy ideas were more retrenchment. They were more about... But again, that's, that's not in line with the facts, as I mentioned. He, he, he talked to the Germans about stepping up their defense, about not giving the c control of the entire energy sector over to Russia, about funding their share of NATO, and he, he funded weapons in Ukraine. Right. So how is that retrenchment? But he, well, he also he also held back a lot of the aid to Ukraine with there was the phone call to Zelensky as well when he was trying to get um, Zelensky to give him some dirt on Hunter Biden, which again I think would have fed in to if would he have wanted to defend Zelensky? Would he have wanted to defend Ukraine after that? I, I don't think that pe people in charge of a country like the United States look at a country like Ukraine and think about the president. I think the geostrategic interests involved. You don't think Donald Trump's petty? Um, I, I imagine that he is petty, but I, I don't think that this decision would have been made on that basis. There's bigger things to, to deal with. And like I say, I think the one thing that I personally think is a positive about Trump is that he was a very good negotiator. So you're right, this may have been avoid, avoided by some kind of negotiation and maybe it would have looked bad in that version of history that would have happened where he might have said to Putin, well, look, keep Crimea. Yeah, these two regions in the East can be independent, but, and the end result might be better than the outcome that we end up with in the end, in terms of at least Ukraine's territorial protection and sovereignty. That could have been possible. And of course, many, many people wouldn't die, which to me, given that it's a country I feel strongly about and have family in, is quite important. Well, by definition, we don't know what would happen with counterfactuals. Quite. Well, Constantine, really appreciated the conversation. And as I said, uh, I've really appreciated a lot of your contributions on this topic. So, Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.